So hello everyone, my name is Otto and I'm here today talking about front-end development in, in Scala. Uh, remember to rate the sessions with the appropriate smiley. Uh, before we begin, I'll just do a quick introduction who I am. Who I am. So during the day I work a company called Umbra where I uh, design and develop our scalable cloud computing platform for optimizing 3D content. Now, you may have not really heard of Umbra before, but you have probably seen uh, other, other products using our technology like the game Rhyme by Tequila Works coming out next month, or World of Tanks, a multiplayer online game, or some blockbusters like Call of Duty, Advanced Warfare, Infinity Warfare, and some games using really large 3D worlds like The Witcher 3, and some other games like Doom, Fallout 4, uh, Final Fantasy 15, uh, Dishonored 2 are all using Umbra technology. Uh, recently we've been moving our focus more into the virtual reality and augmented reality, where we have to cram these huge models into small devices that basically are powered like a mobile device, such as the HoloLens, which is now displaying uh, this kind of a big castle model that has been optimized through the Umbra technology. The Umbra, the company is growing rapidly and we are of course hiring both Scala and graphics programmers in our offices in Finland. Now during the night, I also work in Scala, but on more like open source projects. So last year I published Scala Fiddle, which is an online uh, service where you can just write Scala code in the browser which then gets compiled to JavaScript and then runs, runs in your browser. So this gives you a quick way to try and share and even embed your Scala code without installing anything. And basically it even compiles faster than SBT, so for some simple stuff, it's very good. I've also authored a couple of Scala and Scala.js libraries, such as Diode for functional application state management and Bubicle for super fast binary serialization. Uh, in, in my tests, it's been even faster than Google protobufs on Scala. But let's bet, get back to the topic of developing for the front end and how Scala fits in that world. As we all know, web front end is developed using JavaScript, so let's talk about JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript is like chocolate. The initial taste is very sweet, and you get the immediate satisfaction of getting things done just by writing small blocks of code. Uh, it's a simple language to learn. Even kids can program in JavaScript. The tool chain is also super simple. You t all you need is a text editor and the browser to get started. So when you start developing in JavaScript, you feel very productive right from the start. <laughs> you get to enjoy the dynamic typing and all those things, and you get your first front-end application up and running in no time. Yummy. Then you see that first error in your browser console. <laughs> Undefined is not a function. As JavaScript is not compiled in any way, all programming errors become runtime errors, but that's, of course, quick to fix, and deploying a new version takes almost no time, thanks to the trivial development pipeline. So once your application starts growing, you want to add more features, more libraries, so you can go to the NPM register where you have access to a quarter million JavaScript libraries like LeftPad and so on. Uh, so you don't have to write all your code just by yourself. It, it does complicate your build process a bit because you have to introduce stuff like Webpack or Babel and some other tools, but it's, it's definitely worth it. Now building large JavaScript apps is like building a house of cards. Everything sort of seemingly fits together very nicely due to the dynamic typing, but you have to be extra careful not to make any mistakes that might crash your app at runtime. Especially when you come back to your code, let's say one year later, and you want to make some changes, you notice you have to update some libraries, because what was hot in 2016 is obsolete in 2017, and you need to swap in a new library. But replacing a library in JavaScript is not, not so easy. Your code base is large enough that refactoring becomes difficult, and making the wrong change might actually bring your code base crashing down. So JavaScript is definitely not safe, even in the hands of a very experienced developer. 
Now imagine giving it to someone not so experienced. Uh, it's it's, it's not, not so pretty. I mean, enthusiastic maybe, but it's, it's not enough. But fear not, there's a lot of smart people who have worked around this, on, on this problem, and they have come to the conclusion that while dynamic typing is definitely the best thing since sliced bread, there are places where static typing would actually make sense even in JavaScript to catch those errors at compile time. So enter things like TypeScript from Microsoft or Flow from Facebook. So both of these technologies enhance JavaScript by introducing an optional static typing system uh, on top of it. So they operate a bit differently from each other, but in the end, your code is more type safe. It's easier to understand and to uh, refactor. It's much more IDE friendly, and you can catch er uh, most of the errors at, at compile time. So definitely, if you are writing JavaScript, you should definitely consider using TypeScript or Flow in your application. So JavaScript gives a very sweet deal in the beginning, but for more complex applications, it doesn't really scale. Now speaking of scaling, let's talk about Scala. Uh, so Scala is also a programming language, but it's not like chocolate. In fact, your first encounter with Scala may, be, may leave a slightly bitter and complicated taste in your mouth because Java, you know, because Scala is an acquired taste, much like a full-bodied complex red wine. Now, we all know what Scala is, but for the benefit of those watching this later on video, Scala is a modern multi-paradigm language with strong typing that lets you write programs in the style you want, whether it's functional programming, whether it's object-oriented or functional programming or a mixture of these things. This means that you can get started with Scala very easily by utilizing the familiar features you already know, whether you come from JavaScript, Java, or even PHP. <laughs> So it's also expected that in the beginning your code is not going to be idi idiomatic Scala right away, and you will be only using like a fraction of the features. It's probably some resembles the code you used to write uh, previously. And this is fine, it gets things done, and over time you will learn to appreciate things like functional programming, immutability, and the benefits of strong typing. Uh, now some people criticize Scala for not, not being pure enough allowing you to write imperative code and so on. But I think that Scala is great for pragmatic programmers who want to get the job done efficiently and neatly. For the purists, there are other languages out there <laughs> to suit their needs. <laughs> so in a sense, Scala is an incredibly versatile, scalable, and solid language that powers banking systems, online services like Twitter, Zalando, Airbnb, and many more. But that's all back-end stuff, and we are interested in front-end, so what can Scala do in the browser? As it turns out, quite a lot. So let's talk about Scala.js. So when you use Scala.js, you are actually writing just normal Scala code. All the great features of Scala are there from strong typing to extensive standard library, and the Scala.js compiler plugin basically handles all, all the transformation to JavaScript. It actually takes all your application code and library code and performs full program optimization. And this is very crucial because it allows you to write idiomatic Scala code using all the standard library collections and things like that. And in the end, you still get very highly optimized code that is pra practically at the same level as writing native JavaScript. But these great things don't happen without great minds. And it, also holds true with Scala.js. So Scala.js was conceived by this young Belgian compiler hacker, Sebastian, uh, about four years ago. He laid the foundations for the compiler and started building the infrastructure and has been working on the project ever since. He didn't have to work on the project alone for that long, as in 2014, Tobias also joined in on the effort. So these guys are basically the two guys who are the core, core contributors to Scala.js to this date. But to create something that you can really use for production work, you need more than just a compiler, you need libraries. And that's basically what, how Yi did, and sort of single-handedly bootstrapped the whole Scala.js ecosystem. And the combined efforts of, of these three guys basically made Scala.js what it is today. It's the best platform for developing complex and robust front-end applications. 
Uh, by now, Scala.js has been stable and production ready for over two years. And it's used by a lot of companies from small startups uh, to large enterprises powering their complex web front ends. So in short, Scala.js is stable, it's production ready. Uh, the compiler and the libraries are very mature and well tested. It provides extremely good developer experience, especially if you compare it to JavaScript for creating these scalable front-end applications. It provides an isomorphic development er environment where you can use the same code base, both on the server side and in the client side, as we saw in the previous presentation by Hao Yi, if you happen to see that. Uh, you can share a lot of code structures and even code between the front end and in the back end. But it also has a very good interoperability with JavaScript. So if you want to use JavaScript libraries or you need to use them, then those are easy to use from, from your Scala.js code. And there's a lot of libraries out there that already support Scala.js, I mean Scala libraries. And the ecosystem is really great. Uh, documentation is very good and you can get a lot of help from different chat channels or Stack Overflow. So really highly recommended. But on the front end, it's not all about code. You also have to deal with things like HTML and CSS. Uh, these are traditionally like text only things that you are writing CSS as, as a text file, HTML as a text file or embedded template and so on. But with Scala JS, you actually have libraries that offer you like strong, strongly typed uh, libraries that for for handling HTML and CSS, such as Scala tags and Scala JS DOM and Scala CSS. So it sort of makes sure that your HTML is properly formed. Uh, for example, all of this is just regular Scala code. You don't need to use any separate templating language or work with plain text files at all. You just get to enjoy the full power of the Scala language. Uh, you get the great ID support with all the auto completion and error checking. And, and the result is either like a tree of DOM objects that you can insert into the browser or you can render as text as we've done here. And it's the same for CSS. You can use, you can use Scala variables and all the constructs to build the CSS. You don't need to worry about using less or SCSS or these other things that make sort of CSS manageable. And you can see that it's, you can use it just like you would use CSS. You don't even have to invent the class names that in CSS are in the global scope uh, and can be a source of problems, but the system will basically generate all of this for you. Now in practice, however, you usually want to work with some, of, some, some web application framework that works with Scala.js. So there are three main categories. First, there are these different wrap wrappers around existing JavaScript libraries, such as Scala.js React, which is probably one of the most popular ones. The second group is uh, these reactive frameworks that propagate changes via binded properties. And in the third category, you have these more complete web application frameworks that provide more things than just the UI, for example, RPC and REST communication. So if we look at Scala.js React a bit closer, it's just a sort of uh, simple wrap. Well, it's not sim definitely simple, but it's a sort of a thin wrap around React.js. And it provides type safety and supports FP kind of programming using, using React. It also comes with a custom router and a lot of utilities that make, help you uh, write efficient front-end code. Uh, what the HTML generation in Scala.js React look like, looks like is, is like this. Basically, it's pretty similar to Scala tags or JSX that you would use in, in React. The angle bracket namespace prefixes are optional, by the way. You don't have to use them. But it, it gets the benefits of, of using type checking and all, all those other things. Now, binding.scala and these other reactive data binding frameworks work a bit differently from React because you define properties and variables that are sort of live, that when you make a change to the property, it gets automatically uh, distributed to wherever you're using that property. So it works in, in a sort of similar way that like 
frameworks like Angular works. Uh, it's also type safe, but it's much smaller uh, than, let's say, using React because it's all, all Scala and you don't need any additional JavaScript libraries. Uh, for example, in binding.scala, uh, it's, it's using the XML feature of Scala compiler, so you can define your HTML by writing almost exactly HTML, uh, just as you would do in, let's say, React JSX. Uh, like in this, in this example, if something is changing, changing in the to-do uh, object, let's say the completed, then the DOM is automatically updated by the library, just the part that needs to be touched. So it's very efficient as well. Uh, now, the frameworks, the big frameworks like Udash provide a more, more full web application framework uh, than, the, than the previous ones. And it's again like type safe and data bindings are there. So it's like a combination of of, of some, some of the other libraries. But it also have such more extensive features like routing and RPC and even some UI components on top of the basic stuff. So internally it's using Scala tags, Scala tags so it looks pretty similar as, as we've seen before. Now even with all these great UI frameworks available for Scala.js, I, I felt that they were not, not quite taking things far enough, so I started this project, Suzaku. Now, Suzaku is, is a mobile-first web application framework written, written entirely in Scala. So the goal is that you can do everything in Scala. You don't have to worry about the JavaScript. You don't even have to know that there is JavaScript underneath. And it has a very straightforward value proposition. Uh, so that Suzaku helps developers create beautiful, functional, efficient applications for mobile and desktop web. It's easy and fun and safe to use and lets developer work purely in Scala. Now, one of the rationales behind Suzaku is, is mobile performance. As, as we know, mobile devices are becoming more and more common. Everybody has one, and a lot of, lot of the web usage is moving to the mobile, so you have to make sure that things work nicely there. It's a very constricted environment compared to the desktop. You have poor connectivity, the screen size is small, uh, the CPUs are not as powerful. You have to be careful about saving battery life and so on. So although mobile CPUs have limited horsepower, they do have two or four cores. Uh, but most web apps don't really take advantage of this because JavaScript, of course, is inherently single-threaded. So just this week, Facebook launched a total rewrite of their React library called React Fiber nowadays to address these performance issues, especially on mobile, that they have with React. And you know why it's called Fiber? because they heard a doctor say that fiber is good if your UI is constipated. <laughs> but Suzaku takes a bit different approach in its architecture because it's designed for multiple cores. What it means in practice is that the UI and the application are running on different cores using technology called web, web worker. And the immediate benefit of this design is that the UI stays responsive. And this is basically what Facebook means that React has a performance problem is that the responsiveness of the UI is suffering because whatever you are doing, the UI is running in the same thread and it's, it's blocking animations and things like, things like that. So with Suzaku, that problem goes away because the UI is, is running independently of your application. So no matter what you are doing in the application, the UI always feels responsive. And Suzaku also makes it easy to utilize even more cores if you have to do let's say, more heavy background tasks. So in the browser, you don't really have threads. You have these things called web workers. They are more like sort of independent processes because they don't share memory. So the only way to communicate between web workers is to post messages back and forth. And these messages can be JavaScript objects, strings, or binary data, uh, of which the last option, the binary data, works best with Scala.js because we can use, a, uh, sort of utilize efficient binary serialization uh, provided by libraries like Boopyhool. Uh, of course, the use of serialization and sending these messages back and forth uh, introduces some overhead, but the benefit of utilizing these multiple cores definitely out outweighs by a wide margin, uh, especially from the user experience point of view. 
to make the communication easier and type safe, Susaku utilizes this uh, virtual channel system provided by the Arteria library, another library I created basically for this project. So Arteria hides the underlying plum plumbing and gives you a clear type safe protocol for sending messages between the UI and the application. For example, each visible widget in the UI has its own channel uh, to, do this, to do this communication over. Now in Suzaku, there's a very strict division of labor between what, what happens in the UI and in the application. In the UI, you of course handle all the interaction when the user is clicking something or typing something or selecting something. Uh, all, all the rendering happens there, naturally. Uh, animations, so your application doesn't have to worry about the animations, they are all handled by the UI thread. Uh, transitions from one view to another, an expansion of components, let's say you have a drop down or a time picker, then all, all these things that happen only on the UI side are kept in the UI side. And as you can see, this first letter, letter spell I rate which is sort of a description of how you feel when you have to deal, deal with all, all this. So the point of Suzaku is trying to isolate all that. So for example, if you have to deal with JavaScript, this is the place you have to deal with. On the application side, you don't. Uh, on the application side, it's of course the data model where, where everything, you know, the state of the application lives. Uh, the presentation, you describe that what you want to show. Uh, in the, in the application, you handle the navigation that, okay, you want to switch views, you want to go to some other, other part of the application. You do validation, form input, those kind of things. And of course, communication between the back end. And here, the first letters spell dipunk, which is, which is like Polish for lovely. <laughs> well, no, not really. So the protocol message channel based approach opens like more avenues than just doing web, web development. Uh, so what if your mobile web application could also be compiled to native Android or iOS application instead or as a desktop application, just much like Electron uh, makes possible for, for JavaScript. Because Suzaku has been designed to work in a cross-platform environment from the get-go. So separating the application code from the platform specific implementation makes it possible that you, you can do things like in React Native instead, except that instead of having JavaScript around there, you can actually have like fully native Scala JVM based Android client. And if, if once, once Scala Native, Scala JVM, JVM based Android client, so once Scala Native gets there, with iOS support, then it's also possible to build native iOS applications that are truly native, not something that's running JavaScript inside the application. Initially, of course, we are just targeting web. That's the easiest one. But Android is probably following quite soon because there's, there's, it's all already possible to do Scala applications on, on Android. Uh, so testing becomes also a lot easier because when you have the UI and application separated by this well-defined protocol, then you can sort of throw away the UI and just fake it with a, like a headless uh, test, test UI that you can then control from your application. So you don't have to do that kind of real UI testing. And one interesting part of this protocol is also that you can really separate the application. Like, of course, this whole idea is, is old. Like X window system has been using this from 1984 or something. So it's, it's not, not like a new thing to separate application and the UI that's, uh, that's rendering it. But it, it also enables things like you can actually run the application on your server and have the UI only on the client. So this kind of very thin client approach, if that's something you want, might be great for debugging some things. Uh, so the UI is defined pretty similar as, as in React or React Native. You have this descriptive render method where you just describe that, okay, this is, this is the kind of UI I want. These are the components, these are the widgets that should be there. And then it's, it's basically the job of the Suzaku framework to figure out that, okay, what's, what's in there right now and what was there before, and then do the calculations and the complex sort of 
figuring out that, okay, what has actually changed? That what, what, should, what, what should we do with the DOM to actually uh, get, get, get the result that, that the user is, is currently, want, currently wanting? And this, this piece of uh, sort of diff, diffing engine is sort of similar to what you have in React, except in React, you have to deal with a virtual DOM, so you have to deal with the individual DOM elements and the whole DOM tree. But because in Suzaku, you don't need, you don't have anything to do with HTML and CSS in your application. It's all hidden in the UI, so it's much higher level components, higher level widgets that the diffing algorithm has to deal with. So it's it's much more efficient in that sense. Now Suzaku is is also using uh, diode. Well, it's not exactly using, it, there's no strict dependency, but, but the application model is sort of built around the same kind of idea that you have this application state somewhere that, that you are modi modifying and then creating new application state, which then reflects the UI and so on. So having your, all your application state in this single immutable model promotes clarity in your code and makes it a lot easier to reason about. Uh, in Diode, the application sort of revolves around this circuit, which is handling the incoming actions, and then the actions through the circuit mo modify the model, and then the views are reading model, and then when there is user interaction, the views create these actions that again modify the model and so on. There is also a simple effect system for things like network communication that you can start loading something and when when, when the loading is done, then again an action is dispatched and that then updates the model and so on. And it helps in testing because with, with the effects sort of uh, separated, then you can just go ahead and ignore them in your tests if you want. So the long-term goals for Suzaku are many contributors. It's easy to double the size of contributors by just introducing another contributor at this point of time. But I think this is quite crucial for a lot of these libraries because typically all these libraries have like one person doing all the work. And that's true not just for ScalaJS UI libraries, but for like most libraries. That it's, it's difficult to get like real contributors who are, understand the underlying mechanisms are able to really contribute on all things. But because Suzaku is, is having like very high modularity, there's a lot of interface area where you can do these contributions, then it's easier to get, get started. Let's say somebody wants to do uh, the Android uh, front end for Suzaku. It's, it's totally separate thing. It's nothing, nothing to do with the core and so on. So it's, it's easier to get started. Uh, one thing that's quite crucial is also the internationalization and localization because we are dealing with, with the user interface. And this is, again, something that most libraries just sidestep that, okay, it's, it's all left to the user, uh, all left to the developer to handle these kind of things. But Suzaku aims to have, have good support for, for these as well. And of course, having great documentation with examples, this is, again, a very crucial thing for, for sex, success of any library that you want, want people to be able to get, get going very quickly. And in the end, we want it to be just the best cross-platform UI framework, uh, regardless of what Facebook and these other small players might be doing <laughs> in, in the same space. Because we, we know that we are using Scala language, they are using JavaScript, so we already have a great edge on, on, our, on our side in that sense. But of course, currently, it's started Status is still very experimental. You can go to GitHub, download the source code. There is not very much documentation yet because a lot of things are still changing quite rapidly. Uh, hopefully, we can get like a beta release out in, you know, in during, during this summer. Let's see how that goes. But definitely, it's, it's in, in that sense ready that you can already do simple, simple things and it will update the UI and you can have, you can have interac interaction there. And so the sort of basic, basic core functionality is there. But there's still a lot of, lot of features missing. But yeah, I think it's almost time to get started on the important things, which is drinking. And so I'm just going to say thank you. So any questions? Hi, so uh, when you talk about uh, isomorphism between the uh, server side and the uh, 
front end, uh, the focus seems to have been on uh, the code, mm -hmm. and the various presentations I've, I've seen. So uh, is there any consideration to uh, isomorphism uh, on the data side like you would have in a full JavaScript-based stack, you know, where actually the data exchange format is uh, JSON? Mm -hmm. And um, taking this one step further, so uh, you know, Scala supports um, embedded XML. Wouldn't it be cool if Scala supported uh, embedded JSON? Then this would be like at a at another level. Yeah, I think typ typically when you are dealing with JSON, you use serialization from case classes back and forth to JSON. So the question I think is is really that: Do you need to expose a JSON API that is being used by someone else than your? own Scala front end because if you are just dealing with your own code base that you have Scala on both sides, then you can use binary, pro binary protocols or whatever. But I think the JSON thing comes to play when you need to deal with like exposing a public API or things like that. But yeah, so both, both things work. Any other questions? It was clear as day, the presentation. Yeah. Now you just go and download the source code and start hacking. Okay, thank you.